Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. So we'll continue our discussion of arguments and evidence covering some of the material that we looked at already and introducing some further exploration of these key concepts in argumentation. I want to focus on how we find arguments. That is, what is it we're looking for in spoken or written discourse that signals to us that an argument is underway? What are the parts of the argument? So we want to be able to identify arguments in public discourse, and we want to be able to distinguish argumentative discourse from what we call exposition, that is, assertions in a discourse which are not participating in the argument. They're not part of the argument. We want to know how others have reasoned about an issue, which we get an idea about when we read the transcript, for instance, of an argumentative discourse, or when we read a written argument. It gives us some insight into how the author or the speaker is reasoning about an issue. And it also tells us what their invitation is for our reasoning. That is, how do they expect us to reason about the same issue? We get to know that, we have some insight into that, when we can discover what the arguments are in a discourse. So just as a way of review, what are the essential elements of an argument? Arguments, remember, must have at least two statements, a claim and evidence. Now, it can have more than two statements, of course. Uh, the claim could be supported by multiple statements of evidence, for instance. But the minimum is every argument must have at least two statements, a claim and evidence. Arguments must also invite inference making, suggesting that the claim is grounded on the evidence. That is, you must be able to recognize that there is some connection between the evidence that's introduced and the claim that is made. There must be a way that you could explain that knowing the evidence is true or accepting the evidence as true would make it more likely that the claim was true or would make it more probable that you would accept the claim as true. And when that's happening, there's inference making going on. So we want to, when we study argument, argumentative discourse, whether spoken discourse or written discourse, we want to look for the claim and the evidence in the discourse. And then we want to think about the invited inference. We want to be able to express explicitly what that mental connection is between the claim and the evidence. So again, just by way of quick review, the types of claims, recall that we discussed different types of argumentative claims. There were factual claims, value claims, 
and policy claims. And then, of course, under the category of factual claims, there were historical claims, causal claims, and predictive claims, but all of them different types of factual claims. And we can identify a claim looking at a discourse and looking at the various statements that might be part of an argument. We could identify the claim by asking which statement is controversial or in need of proof before it's accepted as true. Because one of the characteristics of a claim is that it cannot stand on its own. It is not self-evident which means that when a person advances the claim, there's the expectation that they will also provide some evidence or proof that the claim is true. So by itself, it wouldn't be necessarily believable, but it could, uh, we could strengthen our belief in the claim by providing additional evidence in the form of a second statement, the evidence statement, to support that claim. So when we're trying to identify the claim, we're looking for the statement in the discourse which initially at least is controversial or which cannot stand on its own without some proof, evidence, or reasoning. So what are the types of evidence? Again, we talked about this briefly, but let's just review quickly. There are various types of evidence that can be advanced in support of any claim. We talked about observable facts and conditions, things that you can measure and see, things that you can observe yourself, things uh, that are obvious to us or self-evident. Then there's also opinion as to fact. That is, we may not be uh, apprehending a fact directly, but we get the testimony of that truth from someone else. It may be that we turn to a reliable or authoritative source for that opinion as to fact. That also can serve as evidence. Then there are the statements which um, express widely held beliefs or public knowledge. That is things that most of us know. George Washington was the first president of the United States. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. The kinds of things that we know because of our common culture, our public knowledge, our experience growing up in American life, and that kind of thing. And then there are the previously established claims. That is, in the course of a chain of reasoning or a chain of arguments, if we start off with a claim that's controversial or doubtful, we can then support that claim with evidence. Once we've supported it in a convincing fashion, the claim is now accepted as true. And once that claim becomes accepted as true, then it can function as evidence for a subsequent claim. So these would be the four types or categories of evidence. So we identify the evidence in a discourse by asking, which of the statements here is already accepted as true or probable? That is, most people take this to be true or most people would accept it as very likely, right? Um, and so, which of those statements helps me to accept the truth of the claim? The claim can't stand on its own, so which of the statements here helps me believe the claim to be true? And then, when you find that statement that, that's the helper statement, so to speak, that's the evidence. So when we think about evidence, we have to remember that evidence must be considered true to function as evidence. It may, of course, be the case that a person who is asserting an evidence statement is mistaken. So it doesn't necessarily for certain have to be true, but it must be considered to be true to function as evidence. That is, most people must believe it to be true in order for it to strengthen the claim that's being made. Evidence does not, however, have to be empirical or material. Now, certainly what we talked about as observable facts and conditions, that is empirical or material evidence. But of course, we've said also 
that there are other kinds of evidence. So evidence doesn't necessarily have to be something you can measure or something that is concrete. It can come from a reasoning process, maybe based in widely held beliefs or experience. If a statement of evidence remains controversial, that is, if you introduce what you take to be evidence, but people don't accept that evidence statement as necessarily true, then you can't yet move on to the claim. So it can't support a subsequent claim until the evidence itself has been proven to be true. So if a statement of evidence remains controversial, it cannot support a subsequent claim. It must first itself be established with further evidence. So here's an example of what I'm talking about, the sort of uh, process of reasoning in argumentation. Suppose I tell you, President Trump is going to resign his office by the end of the week. That would be a claim. It would be a pretty outrageous claim, unexpected, certainly doubtful, controversial. And you might say, oh, you're nuts. This would never happen. But then I say to you, Vice President Pence said as much just this morning. And that would be my evidence, right? But it's still not convinced. You might say, you must be mistaken about what you heard, or, or he must have been speaking hypothetically. And so here we have a case where I've introduced a claim, the president's going to resign, and my evidence is the testimony of Vice President Pence. But you're still doubting the claim because you now also doubt the evidence that I've introduced. You said I must be mistaken or about what I heard, or he must have been speaking hypothetically, or I've taken the quotation out of context or something, but you're not convinced on the basis of the evidence that I've introduced. So the claim hasn't been established yet because you don't take as true the evidence that I've offered in support of the claim. So what do I do now? So I have to have further evidence to prove that the initial evidence statement that I made is true, okay? So one thing I could do now, seeing that you're still not convinced, I could turn to Wikipedia, which gets updated rapidly, especially on matters related to the president, right? Or more likely, I would give you the front page of the Boston Globe with the headline, Trump ready to resign, and the highlighted quotation from the vice president. Thus, I've provided evidence in support of the evidence. So here's the Boston Globe, it's got the headline, and it has the very quotation that I mentioned from the vice president. This now solidifies the evidence that I gave you and makes it more convincing to you now that the claim I made was true. So what process did we follow, right? So that Boston Globe, um, front page, right? We know this is evidence because it would be accepted as true, at least by most people, and because it would aid your assent to the previous claim, making more believable what had previously been doubtful. So let's review the, the process, the reasoning. You were initially skeptical about my claim. President Trump's going to resign. Oh no, that, that can't be right. You must be nuts. But then, uh, because you're not convinced, I gave you testimony about the vice president's remarks. But even then, that wasn't convincing to you. So I gave you the newspaper to see for yourself. And there is both the headline, Trump ready to resign, and the quotation from the vice president. So the previously doubtful evidentiary claim about the vice president's confirmation is now established. So at work is the what we would call the warrant, or the implicit warrant at least, that the Boston Globe is a reliable source of American political news. Now, notice in my argument, I didn't say that anywhere, but I'm relying on you to sort of fill that in on your own. I'm relying on you to recognize that if I show you the front page of the Boston Globe, you will take that as a credible source, a reliable source of American political news. That is, the Boston Globe has proven, proven mostly trustworthy in its reporting 
on American politics. And so knowing that it's a reliable or credible source is what we would call the implicit warrant. That is, it warrants or supports the, the idea that what is printed in the globe is true. All right? So you infer that the original claim about the resignation is likely to be true because you saw the headline in the globe and you saw the very quotation in the globe from the vice president that I had initially used as evidence to support my claim. So the fact that you are now more persuaded after seeing the evidence means both that there has been an argument and that you have made an inference, actually probably two inferences. What, what the globe has printed is true and the vice president's um, quote, uh, the vice president's statement about the resignation of the president proves the president then is likely to resign by the end of the week. So when we think about evidence, I want to talk a little bit more about what Aristotle considered to be what he called his proofs, right? So this will be uh, a review of some material you probably got in Propaganda and Persuasion. But just as a reminder, Aristotle tells us there are different ways in which uh, we can support argumentative claims. He distinguished between two main categories of evidence or proof. There was artistic proof, which was the reasoning or the appeals constructed by the speaker or the writer. And you probably recall that the sort of artistic modes of proof are ethos, pathos, and logos. But then there was also inartistic proof, which is evidence used by, but not invented by, the speaker or the writer. That is to say, there are certain things, especially things that, again, um, like uh, observable facts and conditions, that is the empirical or material uh, proofs, which exist independent of any statement or any discourse crafted by an orator or a writer, which nevertheless can serve as evidence and be convincing to an audience, to a listener or a reader. The artistic proofs would include the lines of argument or forms of reasoning common to all rational people. So under that category of logos especially, which is sort of the argumentative element of Aristotle's rhetoric, we have these what he would call commonplaces or common topics or general topics, lines of argument or forms of reasoning common to all rational people. This isn't something really that you need to uh, learn brand new because you've been doing it all your life. As a rational person, you have used these forms of reasoning even if you didn't know exactly what to call them. So some of them from Aristotle, for example, would be argument from definition, argument by example, argument from consequence, or argument by analogy. And as the semester goes on, we will uh, review all of these and many others of the common forms of uh, reasoning used in everyday argumentation, everyday conversation. Okay? Uh, so these would be under the category of artistic proofs. But then the inartistic proofs, Aristotle would consider um, in his time mainly things like testimony, laws, and contracts. So we've already talked a little bit about testimony, that is opinion as to fact, but also things like the existing law. If we had an argument, for, for instance, about whether it was legal or illegal to walk on Hampton Beach without a mask on, right? We might turn to the actual text of the law or the actual text of the regulation or guideline to determine what was and was not a violation of that. And so that law becomes evidence in support of a claim that it is or isn't against the law. And likewise, the terms, the language of a particular contract. So these are external facts, which nevertheless function in a persuasive way. That is, they can function as evidence in an argument. And we would also include within this category something probably that Aristotle didn't think much about, but anything that establishes the truth of a claim uh, 
but is not crafted by a speaker or a writer. So things like photographs, DNA evidence, statistics, Wikipedia, scientific experiments, the Boston Globe, these would be external sources of evidence which function to support a claim, but which are not created or invented by the argumentative genius of a writer or a speaker. And that's why Aristotle refers to this kind of evidence as inartistic proof. So now that we've talked about claims and evidence, different types of evidence, let's just review quickly the basic process of reasoning, keeping in mind that when we argue, that is when we engage in inference making or reasoning, right, we are always following essentially the same process. We are moving from things we know and using that thinking about what we know to determine about something we don't yet know. We're always moving from what is known to what is unknown. And we get from what is known to what is not yet known through the process of inference making. So what we know is the evidence, right? What we don't yet know or what we do not know, we're making a claim about. And because there's a link between what we know and what we don't yet know, we can reason about what we don't yet know by inference making on the basis of evidence. So let's look at a few short examples to see how this works, okay? So all of these examples are going to be arguments. Your task is to determine in these short arguments which of the statements functions as the claim and which of the statements functions as the evidence. There isn't a necessary order in which that happens. Within a discourse, you could have a claim come first followed by the evidence, or you could have evidence first followed by a claim. So it takes an analysis of the argument to determine, okay, which of the statements here seems like it cannot stand on its own, or which of the statements here falls into that we're not sure or we don't quite know category, and then which of the statements seems to be uh, part of that this is something we know category, right? So in other words, which is the claim, which is the evidence in the argument? Here's uh, the first brief example. The construction crew stopped digging. They must have unearthed an old graveyard under the city street. If you look at these two statements, the blue statement, the red statement, which do you think is the claim and which do you think is the evidence? Now, if we think about this in terms that we just discussed, that is, what do we know or what, we, what can we know and which are we unsure about or which do we not know yet? Okay. If you're walking down the city street, you see that the construction crew has stopped digging. That's important to note. You see that the construction crew has stopped digging. That's an observable fact, okay? So that tells us this is the evidence here. And then also look carefully at the other statement. They must have unearthed. We're not sure. We don't know that yet. They must have unearthed an old graveyard under the city street. That seems to be uh, speculative. It's uncertain. Um, why, if I just said they must have unearthed an old graveyard under the city street, it could be true, but you wouldn't have any reason to believe it's true necessarily, right? But then if I tell you, oh, but the construction crew stopped digging, that would be evidence that perhaps they found something and that's a good reason for them to stop digging while they bring in the city archaeologist or the city historians to look at the artifacts that have been discovered, right? And so um, that tells you there's a process of reasoning here. There's an inference being made. Certainly it isn't the only reason a construction crew would stop digging, but you could see a connection between discovery of something seemingly valuable under the city street and 
the necessity of stopping work on a construction project to preserve what was valuable. Now, you would have that information from your general knowledge. That would be how you would make the connection or the inference between the two parts. So as we're looking at this example, we want to know which statement is the claim and which statement is the evidence. The claim is they must have unearthed an old graveyard under the city street. The evidence is the construction crew has stopped digging. So here's another example. See if you can figure this one out. In my opinion, the president's budget will likely be defeated in Congress because it does little to reduce the national debt. So again, the question is, which of these statements is the claim and which of these statements is the evidence? And in this instance, I've given you another clue. Look at the word because. Now, because is what we call a logical indicator or an argument indicator. And what it indicates, first of all, is that reasoning is going on and it also tells you the direction of the reasoning. So in this instance, what seems like the observable or known fact, right? Or, or what is the thing that we know and what is the thing that we're not yet sure about or that we don't know, right? Because argument always works from what is known to what is unknown. So in this case, we have the first statement in my, and, and notice also too, it's all one sentence, but we have two statements within the one sentence because sentences are grammatical units, statements are logical units. So in the first statement, in my opinion, the president's budget will likely be defeated in Congress. First of all, the fact that's an, an opinion doesn't disqualify it as argumentative. In fact, most people's opinions in, involve them making arguments, right? Um, and what is the opinion that is expressed here? The president's budget will likely be defeated in Congress. Now, that's a predictive claim. We don't know that's going to happen. But, but what evidence is given in support of that predictive claim? In this case, it does little to reduce the national debt. How would we know that? Well, we could observe that. You could do the math in the budget. So that's why that statement functions as evidence. But the other clue here is that word because. And because tells you when you see because and when because is used in argument, it's always telling you that the evidence follows, right? So we have claim because evidence. So when you see because, that signals or signifies here comes the evidence, right? So the first or red statement is the claim. The second or blue statement is the evidence. And because is the clue that reinforces that um, conclusion. And because because tells us evidence is following. Here's another example. The New Hampshire governor will likely sign the bill lowering the drinking age. So Professor Farrell will need to change his example of, uh, in his lecture about status quo. In this case, again, we're trying to ask which of these statements do we know and which of the statements is functioning as uh, a speculative claim or something that we don't know, okay? The New Hampshire governor will likely sign the bill lowering the drinking age. Is it for certain? No, but that can still be evidence, right? If everybody believes this is likely to happen, that functions as evidence. So what will be the result? This is like a causal claim. Professor Farrell will need to change the example in his lecture about status quo. And here the clue is the word so. So is like the word because, except when you see so, it tells you a claim is following, right? So it is an argument indicator, 
but it tells us what follows is the claim. And so the first statement here, the blue statement again, is the evidence the governor's likely to sign the bill lowering the drinking age. And then what will follow from that? In other words, we're reasoning to the consequences of the governor signing that bill. And so we reason to the consequence or we reason to the conclusion Professor Farrell will need to change his example in his lecture about the status quo. So which statement is the claim? The red statement about the lecture and changing the example. Which statement is the evidence? It's the blue statement, the governor is likely to sign the bill lowering the drinking age. But again, the clue to the structure of the argument and the direction of the reasoning here is the word so. That indicator tells us here comes the claim or evidence comes before this kind of indicator. So I talked a little bit about indicators, but let's uh, review this just a little bit more. There are two main groups of what we call argument indicators. The first is what we call the therefore group. And the therefore group works essentially as saying evidence, therefore claim, right? And so you don't always say or don't always use the word therefore. There are variations on that. And there is no requirement or necessity that you use any indicator. But it is the case that in both speaking and writing, people who are arguing want members of the audience to follow their reasoning. And so these are words that typically get used to help make that reasoning clear. So the therefore group uh, of indicators tells you that the claim follows. When these indicators are present, the argument structure is typically evidence, therefore claim, right? And so here are some of the therefore group. Therefore, consequently, hence, thus, so, implies that, entails that, which shows that, proves that, indicates that, allows us to infer that. In other words, we have evidence, therefore claim, or we have this evidence, so this claim follows, or we have this evidence, consequently this claim will be true, or we have evidence and that proves that this claim is true. That's how that basic structure works. So we look for these indicators in discourse, in written discourse, in um, spoken argument, because they tell us something about the process of reasoning that's going on, and they encourage us to recognize the structure and pattern of the reasoning that is ongoing. There's another one, we may conclude that, suggest strongly that, from which it follows that, and you'll see all these different variations, but all part of what we call the therefore group. And then there is the because group of argument indicators. And this group of indicators tells you that the evidence follows. So when these terms are used in argument, the argument structure is typically claim because evidence, right? So here are some of those from that group. Because, for, since, for the reason that, given that, in view of the fact that, as shown by, as indicated by, as is proven by, as evinced by, in light of the fact that, in this case, so we structure the argument would go basically claim because evidence. So in other words, the claim is true since we believe the evidence or the claim is true as shown by or as is proven by this evidence or the claim is true for the reason that the evidence is accepted as true or the claim is true as indicated by these pieces of evidence, right? So it's claim because evidence. So finally, let's talk about 
tests of evidence, tests of evidence in argument. So obviously not every piece of evidence is as convincing as every other piece. And so how do we make a judgment about which evidence to accept, which evidence is convincing or persuasive? There are tests of evidence by which we can do this. So the first test of evidence is what we call accessibility. We want to be able to know that the evidence is available for examination by others. This is one of the reasons we do source citation in academic writing, right? Because we want to direct readers to the sources of our evidence. And so if evidence is inaccessible, so if I said, for instance, um, University of New Hampshire um, must go back to face-to-face -face classes right away in the fall. God told me this is what he wanted us to do, right? That would be fantastic if God was speaking to me, but that is inaccessible evidence. That is, nobody else can get at that evidence to examine it because it's all happening just in my auditory experience, God speaking to me. And so because that evidence is inaccessible, it would be less reliable or less convincing to others. The second test of evidence is consistency. Is the evidence consistent internally and externally? That is, do the parts of the evidence agree or is the evidence at odds with what we know from other sources? So consistency is one of the ways that we find evidence to be convincing. If you have three witnesses in the trial and they're all saying basically the same thing or telling basically the same story, that is there's consistency between the sources of evidence. Or if you're telling one long story and the, the beginning of the story is consistent with the middle and the end of the story, then that's um, a stronger piece of evidence than evidence that is internally or externally inconsistent. So we're looking that the evidence um, in an argument is consistent, consistent with other sources and consistent within itself. The third test of evidence is relevance. We want to know basically, does the evidence address the point of controversy? Does the evidence have any bearing on the claim? Is the evidence, in other words, relevant? So if we were to say um, the University of New Hampshire uh, should return to face-to-face -face classes because the University of Mississippi has returned to face-to-face -face classes. And we could ask, well, is that analogy relevant? Does it have any bearing on the claim? In one sense, it might because they're both state universities. But if we don't know uh, about the state of the epidemic in Mississippi, or especially if we know that conditions are much different in Mississippi than they are in New Hampshire, then we would question the relevance of the evidence. That is, the evidence wouldn't have any bearing on the claim. Or you might say, well, the uh, University of New Hampshire should um, continue just with online classes because um, during World War II, colleges were closed, right? So does that have any bearing on the claim? Is that evidence relevant to what we're talking about now? Two different national crises, but are they uh, alike enough so that the previous example of World War II is relevant to our current circumstances. So you would test or, or question or investigate the relevance of the evidence to the claim that's being made. Then also we have uh, the test of recency, which is a way of asking, is the evidence timely? Is it fresh evidence or stale evidence? Or has it been displaced by later facts? So for instance, there may have been back in February or March certain models or predictions about the number of people who would die from coronavirus. And uh, if we were still making public policy in August and September and October based on um, findings from February and March, we would ask, well, has there been any new evidence since then? Is that evidence timely? Or 
have those models been proven to be obsolete for one reason or another? Have things changed? So we want more recent evidence. Doesn't mean that historical or older evidence is completely irrelevant or that it can't be useful. It certainly can be, especially if you're writing um, in history. But we also want the most recent scholarship on a topic. For instance, if you're writing an academic paper um, and you're um, turning that paper in for a class in, at the university in the year 2020, right? you don't want to have all your sources from the 1930s and the 1940s. I presume that scholars haven't stopped investigating a topic um, in, uh, back 70 or 80 or 90 years ago. Rather, you want also the uh, most recent scholarship on a particular topic because recency of evidence matters. It's part of what makes evidence credible. And then adequacy. Is the evidence sufficient to support the claim? So here, for instance, there, we might think about, okay, um, one doctor has proposed a, a particular uh, treatment for coronavirus, all right? So, and the doctor says, well, I've given this to six of my patients and they've all done much better. Well, okay, but is that evidence sufficient to support the claim that this should be given to everybody? That is, is there enough evidence here to uh, lead us to believe the claim as it has been advanced? So is the evidence adequate? So as a critical thinking consumer, of public discourse as a critical thinking citizen um, subject to the various claims and arguments of, um, of public officials, you always want to be prepared to test the evidence that's been introduced in support of a claim. Certainly this is true even um, in, in the classroom, right? If your professors are making claims, What's the basis? What's the evidence for them to make a claim? And then ask yourself, is that evidence accessible? Is it consistent? Is it relevant? Is it recent? Is it adequate? All as a way of finding, in a sense, is that true? That is, is the evidence sufficient? Is it timely? Uh, is it relevant? Um, is it consistent? Um, and is it accessible? So these are the tests of evidence. And then we can also even go further and make an assessment about the sources of evidence. Where does the evidence come from? And how does that help us determine whether we ought to take the evidence as persuasive or convincing? And so one of the questions we would ask is about credibility. Does the source possess the necessary expertise or credentials? Does the source have first-hand knowledge of facts? Does the source seem competent, rational, disinterested? So source credibility. Think about this in terms of a jury trial, for instance. We want to know something about who the witness is. Is the witness the brother-in-law of the defendant, right? Um, does the, does, did, the, did the witness actually observe the alleged action, or are they hearing about it secondhand, right? If it's an expert witness, are they actually trained and do they have experience in the area about which they are testifying? This all goes to the credibility of evidence. So for instance, if I'm a rhetoric professor and if I tell you, take this and that drug to help prevent catching COVID-19, you would say, well, that's all very interesting, Professor Farrell, but you know nothing at all about microbiology or medicine or public health or anything like that. You're just a rhetoric professor. And you would be right to say that because I don't have the credibility to introduce evidence on a question or a claim of that nature. Then there is the issue of reliability. So we would want to know what is the track record of the source. Has this source, this person or institution, maybe a newspaper, for instance, or a news outlet, have they proven consistently correct before? Uh, has the source been inconsistent or mistaken? So go back to that example I gave um, earlier about President Trump resigning and the quotation from Vice President Pence and the support for that claim that came from the Boston Globe. One of the reasons you would warrant that Boston Globe evidence 
is because of the globe's reliability, the track record. It doesn't mean the globe has never been wrong, but their track record is pretty good. As a professional journal, jur, uh, journalistic outlet, uh, that major American newspaper has most of the time proven consistently correct, right? And so uh, we would trust or find their evidence reliable. So credibility, reliability, and objectivity. So here it is, we would ask, what's in it for the source? That is, is, there, is the source biased in some way? Do they have some interest in the outcome? Uh, what interest does the source have in one conclusion or another, right? So um, if you, this is why, for instance, if, a, if let's say there was a lawsuit against a corporation and a judge owned stock in that corporation, the judge would be asked to recuse herself or himself because there would be at least the possibility of an implicit bias. That is, the judge might benefit from one outcome or another. And so in this case, we're asking the same thing about the source of evidence. Where's the evidence coming from? And does the source of that evidence, whether it's a person or an institution, right, does the source of, of that evidence have some stake in one particular outcome or another? And if there's a, a way of um, assessing that source to say, yes, indeed, I don't see this as an objective source, then we would find that evidence may be um, less to be trusted, less credible um, than the evidence which comes from a more obviously objective source.